In one of my interviews, Richie Byrick told the story of being on stage with Chet Baker on Chet's Return to America tour. Uh, Richie learned a valuable lesson from Chet's old school approach because of the embarrassing moment that it produced for Richie on stage. Now, let's have some fun with this one. First, I'm going to show you the clip of Richie telling the story. And then I'm going to ask my AI Jazzmaster Chat, which uses those interviews as its brain, to tell the story as a poem. Of all the jazz masters you've played with in your career, who is yeah. the most generous to you? Oh, that's easy. Chet. Of course, Chet. What? In terms of, of, he gave me his heart, he gave me his support, he gave me his feeling, his playing. He was incredibly generous with his spirit and with his information. He was pretty hard. I mean, he was pretty old school. Do you know the story where he was yell he was uh, yelling at me on the bandstand when we did the jazz gallery? Okay. This will be the story. But there's some bad words in here, so I'm telling you it's fun, all right? I've got beef in. Okay, beef, okay. I'm playing the, at the, the uh, jazz, um, jazz gallery in Washington, D.C. in 1978 or 9. Chad had just come back from being in the Italian prison. He had new teeth. He was clean for a while. He had a new record contract with um, Schneider. You know, you can't call him again. And he had a band with me, Eddie Gomez, and Elliot Sigman playing drums. And he was in great state of mind. He had a girlfriend, wonderful girl, Ruth. And he was playing Leaving and Sol and Paradox and Broken Wing, which I wrote for him. We had a week in Washington, six nights, Tuesday through Sunday. It was a big deal because it's a big comeback for Chet. So I bought a red shirt, a red silk shirt, you know, for the occasion because it was TV. And, and in the front row was every jazz uh, magazine, jazz podium, downbeat, all, everything was there. The guys were, 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 you know, had their notebooks out. There was no cell phones. There was no internet. There was no nothing digital. Guys with pencil and paper. And everybody was excited. I was excited and nervous, but was happy, right? Now, in June, in Washington, you know what Washington is like in June? It's like Manila. Terrible humid, right? So I get there, and Chet's feeling very good, very generous, and very happy. He knows he's got a great band. We've got the club is full before the first set. Very cool. On a Tuesday night. So he says, we get up on the bandstand, big round of applause, standing ovation, welcome back, Chet, you know. I sit down, and um, he leans over. We never rehearsed, never. He leans over and says to me, Richie, my foolish heart, play a nice intro. Bring me in, rubato, first date buzz, bring in the guys on the bridge. Boom, okay. I play a nice intro, everybody's quiet, everything's cool, I'm happy. He comes in. You know, so beautiful, right? Every woman in the, you know, in the, in the club is like just weeping, happy, right? Then, before he plays the next phrase, he looks at me and talks into the microphone. He says, Richie, you're too fucking loud. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Shock. Everybody's shocked. The audience is looking at Chet. I'm, and I start to sweat. Now, I'm wearing this red silk shirt. You know what happens when you sweat? With silk, it turns black. Right? Okay. So I'm, I'm not playing loud. I'm playing what I think is soft. But obviously not soft enough for him. So he goes, okay. Now it's Ricardo. I'm playing the chord. I'm trying to play so soft. I've got my foot jammed down on the soft pedal. But it's not soft enough. There's something he doesn't like about what I'm playing. 
he goes back into the microphone and he goes, you're still too fucking loud, kid. That really aggressive. I look in the front row, everybody's riding, all the, all the guys are riding. I think, okay, I had a nice life, nice musical life. This is, now it's over. But, and, and I don't understand. So, and then he finishes the tune. I'm sweating. The shirt is black. I'm dripping wet. <laughs> he finishes the tune. He plays beautiful. I play a good solo. Gomez plays amazing solo. We go to the next tune. Everything's cool. We do the rest of the set. It's fantastic. Standing ovation. Smiling. Everything. Fine. So he starts to go into the dressing room. Everybody's half damn. So I leave him open. Then finally I go in. And I go, check. Can we talk? He said, sure, let's talk after the gig. I said, no. I said, we're going to talk now. He says, okay. I said, why did you humiliate me like that in front of the people? Why didn't you wait and tell me after? He said, because now you'll never forget it. And he was right, man. There was something about my touch that he didn't like and that he didn't think was really good enough to accompany him in the ballot. And I never even thought about it because, remember, he, just, he had a different level of sensitivity. It's Chet Baker, right? He took the trumpet, which is a very macho instrument. It's like, you know, to Olay, like the, 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 the Matadors. You know, well, Freddie Hubbard and, and you think Whitney Marcellus and Woody Shaw, the way they stand there. The trumpets, the real masculine instrument. Chuck takes the same instrument and sounds like he's whispering into your ear. It's so beautiful. And it's a beautiful sound, smooth, in tune. And, of course, it, it very influenced by Miles. By the way, Chet and Miles really loved each other. They were never fighting. That was a bunch of shit. They were best friends. Chet, he loved Miles. They all were cool together. Of course. So, so I said, Chet, man, that was really tough. So you embarrassed me. He said, he said, it's okay. Everybody loved the set. She said, you will never forget to think about your dynamics when you're playing a ballad, a soft ballad. And he looked at me with a big smile. He said, you did great. And you know, Michael, he was right. Because to this day, when I'm playing a ballad, with Glee or with Laurie or Randy or Freddie or anybody, there's this little spark of attention. I go back to that psychologically, like, how's my volume? How's my touch? You've got to play under the horn. you got to play under. Not disappear, but you have to play support, which means usually half the volume of the soloist. And Chet is playing really soft. He's playing, ta -da. So I'm, if I'm playing at a normal soft volume, it's actually too loud. Because the piano has got, you know, 88 keys, and the chord is too dense. It eats up his sound. Mm. So he was right, man. And he marked me forever about that. And that's an old school shit. Because if he, if he would have said, said, Richie, can we talk after the test? say, sure. He said, you know, you're playing too loud sometimes. You've got to modify your touch. I would say, okay, thanks. But this way, I will never forgive it. <laughs> well, I was truly an act of generosity. So here's the poem that Jazzmaster Chat wrote. The night's embrace, a stage alight, with Chet and me in music's right. My keys did dance in soft delight, Yet trouble brewed a sudden blight. First notes did soften hearts so grand, a ballad formed by skilled hands. Chet raised his voice, a firm command, Richie, too fucking loud, I couldn't stand. The world grew hush, my heart a pound, for I believed my touch was sound. Yet Chet declared with voice abound, still too fucking loud, his ire profound. Sweat formed on silk, the crowd did note, reporters' pens like daggers smote. My early dreams on stage afloat, 
now pierced by words, Chet's harshness wrote. The set did end, backstage I flew, to Chet's domain with questions slew. Why humiliate? What must I do? His answer clear, his method true. You'll never forget Dynamics craft. Think of the horn, the singer's shaft. Though harsh it seemed, his wisdom draft, engraving skills in music's graft. And so through Chet, my play refined. A lesson etched forever mind for each soft note in heart and mind. A balance struck, intentions kind.